Hello, I'm Bruce Gewurz, Vice Dean for Academic Affairs and Chief of Surgery here at Cedar sinai And it's our great good fortune to have my friend Brennan Spiegel here with us today. Uh, Brennan is a, a very important individual in our organization uh, with a, a tremendous interest in uh, health uh, services research and other very interesting things. As well, he's a prominent gastroenterologist and a medical editor. Brennan, welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Where were you born and raised? Well, I was born at Cedar sinai as it turns out, uh, the old Cedars of Lebanon Hospital, now the Scientology building. Uh, and I was uh, raised here in Los Angeles, um, grew up right in this neighborhood where Cedars is now, and uh, kind of feel at home here. So what high school did you go to? I went to Brentwood School, yeah. And from there, college and went med to school? Tufts University in, in Boston. And then from there, I went to New York, New York Medical College. And then I came back here to Cedars, where I did my residency in internal medicine. After that, went across town to UCLA, did some training there in gastroenterology, stayed on faculty for about 10 years, and then kind of came back home to Cedars. So what uh, when you were at UCLA and prior to joining us here at Cedars-Sinai, uh, what was your uh, clinical area of uh, greatest interest? Yeah, so I'm a, a general gastroenterologist by training, but I'm very interested in irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS in particular, and also this idea of the brain-gut axis, so the way the brain and the gut communicates sort of back and forth. And we know that a lot of chronic GI conditions are related to underlying stress and anxiety, but it's not as if stress necessarily causes the pain. So a lot of what we do is try and disentangle kind of what's going on with any individual patient. So a lot of my work's been in that area. Yeah, that's very interesting. I remember when I was uh, young and doing gastroenterology before I became a full-fledged surgeon, uh, the question was always whether uh, having, uh, for example, uh, Crohn's disease made you anxious or whether you were anxious and therefore got Crohn's disease. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, sort of a chicken or, or egg sort of situation. I think as it pertains to Crohn's, it's probably not that anxiety causes Crohn's, uh, but it can certainly amplify it, can make it worse. Um, you know, we, we've learned so much about the way the mind and the body communicate. It used to be a little bit of voodoo science, kind of new agey stuff, but now with the sort of frontiers of neuroscience and the ability to do functional MRI scans, we can really see what's happening in the brain with a number of chronic conditions, including irritable bowel syndrome. So people with IBS, there are variations in the way the brain functions and even its structure compared to people who don't have IBS. Oh, tell us more about that. Well, just the way that pain is processed in the brain, for example. Uh, you know, we th when we think about something like pain, uh, not just, um, you know, musculoskeletal pain, but also visceral pain, there's really two components. Uh, there's what Buddha called the two arrows of pain. And what Buddha meant by that is the first arrow is when you're struck by the archer, you get hit and it hurts, right? It just hurts, physically hurts. But the second, Buddha said, was the second arrow is the self-inflicted wound. This is when you look at the arrow sticking out of your shoulder or wherever, and you think, I'm going to die. You know, I'm going to die. Like this is the emotional component to pain. So pain, as an example, is processed in both the sensory cortex, but also in the limbic system and the insular cortex. So it turns out, you know, something like opioids might help reduce the physical component of pain, but might not do anything for the emotional cognitive component. And so when we look at the brain of people with IBS, we notice that the way pain is processed in those centers is a little bit different compared to other people. That's very interesting. I guess it explains why I never mind getting my blood drawn with the needle being stuck in because the pain is trivial, but I tend not to watch the blood dripping out into the tube. Well, this is why we use virtual reality now for needle sticks for people who have this phobia uh, is, you know, it's not really the physical experience. It's, it's, you know, it's trivial, really. If you really focus on just what is a sensory experience of a needle stick, it's really the emotional um, component. It's the it's the anticipation, anxiety, and the amplification of pain that comes from just that fear and anxiety associated with it. So something like virtual reality, for example, can get somebody into a forest or on a beach or somewhere relaxing where they're not even realizing they're about to get stuck. Yes, I mean, that's been extremely interesting. I know over the last five years, you've really focused on the opportunities of virtual reality to change patients' perceptions. How did you first get interested in that? 
And uh, tell us a bit about what you're doing. You know, it goes back to our earlier discussion about IBS, because I've always known that something like IBS can get better with pills like antibiotics or whatever different medicines, but also gets better with hypnotherapy, with cognitive behavioral therapy, with exercise. Every one of those has a randomized controlled trial supporting its benefits. So it just points to this broader interest of sort of mind-body medicine. And when I learned about virtual reality, the first time I used it, I didn't know anything about it. This was about six years ago. And a guy named Walter Greenleaf, who's a professor up at Stanford, came down here to Cedars and he put me in a headset. And I found myself standing on the side of a 50-story building, like on a window washer rig. And he said, all right, now just jump off the building. And I said, no chance. I'm not going to do that. And he said, no, go ahead and jump off. And I thought, no, nah, I'm not going to jump off. But I did. And I realized, oh, my God, this like hijacked my brain. So that was the moment that I learned about VR. And I thought, oh, wow, you know, we can use it for gaming and entertainment, but we can also use it for good. Uh, if we can think about the way it changes our perception of our own body and of the world around us, we can use it to really change the way we think about our own body and our own health. And that's what we've been doing for the last six or so years. So give me an example of how it changes uh, a per one's perception about their health. So, I mean, for example, here at Cedars, we've used VR in over 3,000 patients now. It's amazing it's been that long and that many people. And, you know, one you know person, one patient comes to mind that sort of tells a story. Uh, There's a, a woman who had severe abdominal pain. So, you know, I'm a GI doctor, like I said, and so I got called in to figure out what's going on. I look over her chart, and she's had every test you can imagine. She's had CT scans, endoscopies, colonoscopies, you know, been tested for IBD, celiac disease, everything's normal. But she has this recurrent pain. And I thought, you know, this may be kind of a functional gut disorder, something kind of brain gut. So I put her in a virtual reality headset, and I had her swimming with dolphins. So imagine one moment you're in a hospital room, and the next moment you're underwater swimming with dolphins. And she was silent for about four minutes, and then she started to cry. And I said, are you okay? And she said, yeah, I am. But I think I know what's causing this pain now. And I said, really? Tell me more. She said, you know what? I think it's, I think it's my brother. I thought, your brother? What do you mean? She said, well, my brother, he died of stomach cancer, and I'm going to die that way too. I said, but you know, we've been in your stomach. We had a camera. We looked in there. You don't have, you don't have cancer in your stomach. She said, I know. I know you guys keep telling me that. But I haven't been willing to believe it. But something about these dolphins, they're telling me I need to move on with my life. She said, I could have been on the couch for a year and I wouldn't have figured this out, but I'm ready to go home. And by the way, my pain's all better now. That's a fantastic story and the degree of the, the power of the immersive experience. There's been uh, so much interest, uh, particularly uh, during a pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, about meditation and uh, can uh, virtual reality be a, a short circuit for people who are having difficulty mastering meditation? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I, I just published a book called VRX, came out last year on this whole field of immersive therapeutics. And part of one of the chapters I wrote is about VR as sort of a meditative support technique. And, you know, it's one thing to be a Buddhist monk and to spend on average 44,000 hours of practice for them to do what they do. And what they do, if you look at their brain uh, with an MRI scanner, is they inhibit, they have shut down something called the default mode network or the DMN in the brain. And what that is basically is the part of your brain or the network in your brain that is your inner voice that we all hear. You hear yourself thinking, we're strategizing, judging, critiquing, fretting all day long. And that's the voice that gets in the way of sort of peace and quiet. And so uh, what what Buddhist monks do when they meditate is they have learned how to completely shut that off. And that allows for this lateral thinking. It's kind of like if the conductor of an orchestra walks out and the orchestra can just have jam sessions. So that's exactly how psychedelics work, by the way, psilocybin, LSD. And it turns out VR is like a cyberdelic. It turns out research shows that it works like a psychedelic, but without the pharmacotherapy, to inhibit the default mode network and allow this lateral thinking, which is probably what happened to that patient I just described to you. Yeah, I'm interested uh, as well in your thoughts about uh, using VR to improve athletic performance. I know your, your son is a budding golfer, and I know <laughs> you've taken great pride and interest in that. And golfers have a particular kind of sort of self-hypnosis that they go through and visualizing their shot and having the same pre-shot routine before they execute 
a golf swing. How does VR play into that or other athletics? Absolutely. So VR is really helpful for simulation. Uh, certainly in medicine, we may talk about surgery procedures, that sort of thing. Um, and in golf, and in both cases, you're trying to achieve this sort of flow state, which I know you're very familiar with and have lectured on. And this sort of gets to this point where you're thinking without thinking. But to get to that point, it requires a terrific amount of practice. So in the NFL, for example, quarterbacks are now using virtual reality to see a wide variety of defenses. Uh, so they'll just use a headset and they'll flash a defense and see how quickly they can read that defense over and over and over again outside of an actual game scenario. And they uh, will look at their reaction times and practice over and over again. So there's actually a company uh, out of um, Silicon Valley that's just focused on supplying the NFL with these defensive schemes and virtual reality. Golf's a whole other area um, where you can practice your swing and try to simulate in three-dimensional space how you're actually moving your body um, you know, within space and time. Well, that's really fascinating. What, what, you know, I, I know that you are a preeminent leader in the use of VR and medical applications. If you were to uh, project uh, what life was going to be like relative to these kind of interactions, uh, talk us through what 10 years from now is going to look like. Yeah. Well, we're thinking about that all the time here now as we're establishing a VR consult service here at Cedar sinai And in fact, we just hired a new psychiatrist who's also a VR programmer um, to help us run our new clinical VR service. And, you know, our hope is that, well, 10 years from now, who knows where we'll be with the actual technology. Um, it may end up being a contact lens. Uh, it may just be in your glasses. Um, but whatever it is, the goal is not for people to live in virtual reality because people get spooked by that. Oh, you're just sort of like this dystopian future. The goal is for people to learn something about their mind and their body in virtual reality that they can then bring with them into a real reality. I like to call that RR <laughs> instead of VR, right? So that you can experience a richer real life. Um, and so that could be applied across all of medicine, everything from treating anxiety and depression and PTSD and phobias to schizophrenia to managing pain, IBS, IBD, hypertension, uh, eating disorders, the list goes on and on. And so what we're starting to see is a new branch of medicine that the FDA calls MXR, which is medical extended reality. And we're going to see MXR exploding over the next 10 years, I believe. The FDA now acknowledges this as an actual field of medicine. So we'll see more and more of it. That's fascinating. Uh, so, so sort of as a final uh, question, I know that you're the editor of the American Journal of Gastroenterology. How has that uh, experience informed your personal research? Well, being an editor of a major journal um, is eye-opening on so many levels. Um, it's hard to even know where to begin answering that question, so I'll be brief. You know, if anything, it's, it's ensured that I'm as rigorous as I possibly can be. Uh, I've seen every, every trick that anyone can throw into a data set to try and overinterpret data. I've seen statistics misused. I've seen fabricated data, sort of stuff you, you kind of don't realize happens, uh, but you see firsthand as an editor. Uh, and it's made me a little bit more skeptical, I think, about research in general and my own research, and to be as absolutely transparent as one can be. And also to acknowledge when something doesn't make sense um, and, and just be clear about that and try to fix it. Well, terrific. I, we very much enjoyed uh, talking to you, and we're delighted you're here at Cedar sinai really pushing the field forward. Thanks, Thanks for, for being here. Thanks very much for having me.